Hello friends, a very good day to you. I hope you are enjoying our classes and let us proceed forward with another of our classes. Today we will be talking about the Councils Act of 1909. And the Councils Act of 1909, of course, most of us know, it is also referred to as the Morley Minto Reform Act. And the Morley Minto Reform Act is named after the two important co-sponsors of this uh, Councils Act of 1909, the Secretary of State for India, John Morley, and then we have got Lord Minto as the uh, Viceroy of India. Okay, so uh, let us proceed and see what kind of reforms the 1909 Act brings into effect. Okay, and but before we do that, we should also know the background. And the background to the 1909 Act is the Swadeshi movement. Okay, and then of course the rise of extremism within Congress. Okay, now. The rise of extremism and the Swadeshi movement as it unfolded, it had got the British establishment quite worried. And in order to drive a wedge between the extremists and the moderates, uh, this kind of a, a reform act, okay, reform act which enlarges the role of the councils, the councils uh, which is the imperial legislative council and also the provincial councils uh, is very important, okay. And therefore, the British thought of uh, this reform as important and therefore it was instituted, okay, because of the background of the Swadeshi movement and the the rise of extremism and because of the need uh, that the British felt in order uh, to divide the Congress itself and the members of the Congress by providing them some kind of a, a conciliatory measure okay, and therefore uh, bringing into their own fold the moderate sections of the Congress. However, we should also know uh, that the Act, uh, the Councils Act which was passed in 1892 had already enlarged the roles of the Council and had already enlarged the membership in the Council but this Act, you see, uh, it further enlarges upon those two areas. And the two areas that this act uh, touches upon is all the constitutional area by constitutional we mean uh, the constitution of the councils constitution we mean the membership of the council okay uh, we are not talking about a uh, written constitution or anything of that sort we are talking about the constitution of how it is going to be constituted or how many members are going to be there and also it touches upon the functional aspect that is the function of the legislatures okay and the additional members that will be uh, inducted into the councils their functions okay uh, now before we again before we proceed we should also understand the fact that the councils are in the form of executive and legislative okay this is the formation uh, this is the composition of the governor general's executive council that there will be an executive and there will be a legislative element to it but together they are taken as together okay executive and legislature they are not separate these are the both councils uh, they are together in the form of the imperial legislative council or the governor general's council okay and the governor general takes care of the executive part and through this act, he will also be responsible for the legislative part, okay? And now we can finally proceed into the various provisions of the act. As far as the provisions of the act are concerned, number one, enlargement. What is being enlarged? Of course, the size of these assemblies, the additional members. And remember, the additional members are the members of the legislative. Additional members are not members of the executive, okay? They have nothing to do with the executive, okay? So, the size of the additional members uh, will be enlarged. And this is enlarged in the central executive. This is enlarged from 16 to 60, okay? The number of additional members in the legislative council, okay? in the central council will be enlarged from 16 to 60 and also we have to know that the provincial councils also saw such enlargement so the councils of bengal bombay madras okay then we have got the united provinces which is present day up or uttar pradesh but previously it was known as the united provinces they all saw enlargement of the councils okay and the numbers were 50 each okay 50 additional members and uh, the uh, the councils of burma 
Assam and Punjab saw an enlargement of you see 30 each now additional members in Burma Assam and Punjab will be 30 Bengal Bombay Madras and U uh, United Provinces will have 50 each and the central executive uh, central legislative will of course have 60 members okay so this is the size of the enlargement however we have to understand the fact that out here okay out here official majority was reduced okay previously official majority was paramount within, within the central uh, legislature however now the number of officials british indian officials within the central executive or center sorry central legislative will be reduced to a significant number however uh, we see that official majority will be retained in the central legislature okay so out here we have official majority and in the other provinces official majority is done away with okay non official majority in the other provinces there will be non official majority okay however we should also understand that the legislatures are in uh, constituted in such a way that there is also a provision for uh, you see nominated non officials so non officials were nominated into the office okay non officials were nominated within the legislature and with the inclusion of the non of uh, nominated non official okay we see that the actual elected representatives will always be in a minority okay they can never become a majority because even the non official uh, nominated non officials will always play uh, in the tune of the british okay so along with the ex officio members ex officio the ex officio members are of course those members who are part of the executive okay governor's executive or governor general's executive so along with the ex officio members the official members nominated non official members okay all three of them together they can always overpower the elected or the non officials completely non official members okay they can always overpower the elected or the completely non official members so this is something which is very important to remember about the council act of 1909 or the parliamentary reform acts okay uh, and proceeding forward let us look at the uh, schematics for uh, representation as far as representation is concerned some kind of representative principle okay was also put in place and this was in the form of uh, you see sending representatives by uh, registered uh, you see organizations or registered uh, associations such as landholders associations municipalities then we have got universities okay these are essentially these are interest groups interest groups which have their own specific interests okay and they send their own members to the various councils all right provincial as well as the uh, as well as the central okay so these were allowed to retain uh, return their own uh, representatives apart from that the the very important fact about monumental reforms is the uh, acceptance of the communal principle okay communal principle now what is the communal principle communal principle is a principle which follows the dictat that various religious communities will have their uh, different political uh, you see interest okay so a religious proclivity of a person will also dictate his political proclivity and in order to give voice uh, to this political aspiration of a religious community there shall also have to be a religious representation okay political representation of religious communities i hope you are following it uh, political representation of religious communities uh, which uh, comes from the communal principle the principle being that religious communities have their political interests also okay and therefore the need for political representation of religious communities and this comes in the form of separate electorates separate electorates okay whereby the muslims were given separate representation okay 
So, uh, this is briefly uh, the, the constitutional aspect of the Morlemento Reform Act, okay? how the membership within the councils will be constituted. Apart from that, apart from the legislative aspect, we also have to understand that even the uh, executive, okay, even in the executive, certain Indian members were uh, inducted to the executive okay? and this is very important. The first law member within the uh, within the executive, first Indian law member, okay, within the executive is Lord Sinha, okay. Lord Sinha, so this is the name that you have to remember, okay. Uh, the first law member within the Governor General's executive, okay. So uh, these are the constitutional uh, aspect of the Morlemento Reform Act. Now we will look into the functional aspect. Okay, now let us look into the functional aspects, okay. What will be the functions of these legislative assemblies? Now, if we look at the functions of the legislative assemblies, we see that they can now discuss the budget, okay. They can also pass resolutions on the budget. And apart from that, all right, discussing the budget and passing resolutions on the budget, uh, they can also, you see, make questions, okay? They can ask questions to the executive, all right, to the executive branch, and they can ask supplementary questions. Now, remember, Asking questions to the executive is a very important uh, uh, function of a legislative, okay, as far as the parliamentary system is concerned. And all the Morlemento Act is doing is trying to imbibe a sense of parliamentary functionism, okay, within the Indian councils, that the Indian councils will run accordingly as the British, count, uh, sorry, uh, the British Parliament runs. Some kind of parliamentary, uh, you see, procedures are imbibed within the Indian councils and the asking of questions is a part and parcel of the parliamentary procedures okay and apart from uh, asking the question suppose the que you ask a question to the executive and the executive refu refuses to answer that question they were given the right the legislative was given the right of asking a supplementary question okay asking supplementary questions to the executive of course the executive retains the right of answering or not answering these questions okay now remember that these discussions that they are doing, these resolutions that they are passing or these questions that they are asking, it is all unilateral. There is no actual, no binding agreement between the legislative and the executive that they should function together, okay. The executive might take their, uh, you see, resolutions seriously. They might take their suggestions seriously. They might not take their seri uh, suggestions seriously, okay. Uh, so, as far as we see that there is no hard and fast rule that these resolutions will carry forward uh, to executive Action, okay, so uh, executive action is not bound upon these resolutions. Okay, apart from the budget, uh, they were also allowed to uh, discuss various, uh, you see, uh, problems of uh, importance to, you see, of, uh, you see. Uh, the Indian problems, okay, uh, as far uh, Indian as. Uh, Indian by, by Indian problems, what I mean to say, I'm paraphrasing uh, in a very generalized way, uh, not just Indian problems, uh, you see, of Indian importance, issues of Indian importance or local importance, okay, issues of provincial importance, okay. The very important aspects of state, such as the finances, such as the army, such as, uh, you see, uh, the foreign uh, foreign affairs, all of these are, you see, all of these are at the hands of the governor general and the various governors, okay. But the legislature can, of course, discuss things of Indian importance and things of uh, issues of uh, local importance, okay. So, these are the functions. However, we have discussed the functions, but we should also know that veto is retained by the governor general so uh, any act or any law that is passed by these legislatures or a, that is that has come into effect in the various councils can of course be vetoed by the governor general okay the governor general is the supreme authority and the responsibility of the governor general is not 
to his councils, is not to the imperial legislature, is not to the executive. Okay, responsibility of the governor general is to the British Parliament. Okay, he is responsible to the British Parliament for the administration of India, and he is responsible to the British Parliament through through the office of the Secretary of State for India. Okay, to the Secretary of State for India. So the Governor General responds to the Secretary of State for India, and the Secretary of State for India is the go between the Governor General and the British Parliament. He is not responsible to the councils in any way. So. This is the structure because of which the Morley Minto Act is also referred to as constitutional autocracy. A constitutionalized autocracy. Constitutionally, a, a parliamentary system is put in place. Okay, various provisions are made for representation. Various provisions and functions are also made so that the legislatures could at least discuss things of importance. But at the same time, autocracy of the Governor General and the British Parliament, a foreign parliament within the land of India. Okay, that's why a constitutional. Autocracy. Apart from that, another significant criticism of the government of India, uh, sorry, Councils Act of 1909, is the fact that it introduces the elective principle in a skewed manner. Okay, it is not talking about generalized franchisee. In fact, it talks about separate electorates. separate electorates okay and communal representation so we see that the most damning indictment of the councils act of 1909 is the fact that it was a constitutional autocracy that these legislatures really did not have any kind of power and also it brought into effect one of the most uh, you see uh, duplicitous principle which was introduced by the british in india that is the communal representation okay which becomes a problem which uh, which the uh, you see uh, the various acts which are, which will come after 1909 they are unable to solve the 1919 act 1935 act all of these acts are unable to solve the problem of communal representation because once the dice has been rolled and once the die has been cast that from now on the religious communities will have their separate political interests once that principle is accepted okay there is no moving back this is not what i am saying of course this is what bipan chandra says and i you see wholeheartedly endorse uh, bipan chandra's argument about uh, communalism and the growth of communalism in a political form in india okay so this is in a sense the councils act of 1909 and uh, i hope that you uh, have understood the uh, the various facets of the councils act of 1909 i hope that you enjoy it okay i hope you will be studying hard thank you